guys and welcome to the cycle time section of the Just in Time series. Now, in this section we'll be covering what cycle time is, we'll be going through the different types of cycle time, and then I'll introduce you to operator low charts. Now before we get started, I'll give you a little intro into the subject. There's a book called Rivet Head, and if you've never read it, I highly recommend it. It's written by a former GM assembly line worker named Ben Hamper. Hamper gives his insight into what it was really like working on a GM assembly line. Here's how Hamper describes his working relationship with his assembly line partner, Dale. Dale and I would both report to work before the 4.30 horn. We spent half an hour preparing all the stock we would need for the evening shift. At 5 o'clock, I would take over the two jobs while Dale went and slept in a makeshift cardboard bed behind the bench. He'd stuff some plugs into his ears, crawl into bed, and often be sound asleep before I even finished my first truck. I'd work both jobs from 5 to 9.24, the official suburban blazer line lunch period. When the line stopped, I'd give Dale's cardboard coffin a good kick and rouse him from his sweaty dreams of compression ratios and pork products. I would give my ID badge to Dale so that he could punch me out at quitting time. I have some wonderful memories of sitting on a bar stool on a Friday night at the Limberlost Bar in Houghton Lake, Michigan, 130 miles north of the truck plant, thirsting on my third beer while looking up between the antlers at the clock as it just turned over 2 a.m. At that precise moment, 130 miles to the south, Dale would slide my General Motors ID badge through one of the 12 time clocks. Each worker along a balanced assembly line has to complete a set amount of work within a given time frame. This is called a cycle time. In Hamper's case, he was able to not only complete his own work within a cycle time, but also that of the next workstation. Now, I personally don't blame Hamper for what he did. Instead, I applaud his ingenuity. You, as a manager or organization, need to constantly reevaluate the work that needs to be completed within one cycle time to look for slack or other process improvements. If you don't, obviously someone else will. Now, there's two ways to observe cycle time. The first is to observe the elapsed time between good parts that are produced. The second way is to measure an operator at a single station complete one complete cycle or good part at his station. Both of these are identical. This is an old-fashioned drive through Back in the day, there was only one window where one employee would take the order, take your money, give you change, and give you your food. This took about 108 seconds or 1 minute and 48 seconds. If I was an observer watching this, I would see a car leaving every 108 seconds. In other words, the cycle time was 108 seconds. When drive throughs started appearing in the 1930s, demand wasn't that high for them. 108 seconds didn't seem that bad because it was a vast improvement over going into order. This cycle time of 108 seconds is expressed in an operator load chart. This chart is used to show how long the cycle time is per operator. In this case, there is only one operator. Now imagine that you're sitting at the end of the stream. From time to time, you notice that a leaf floats by. The time that elapses between leaves is called cycle time. Now, let's take a moment to relate this back to our paper airplane exercise. I notice planes coming off the end of the line about every 15 seconds. So, the cycle time is 15 seconds. Now, this is one way to measure cycle time. An alternative way would be to measure exactly how long it takes to complete a single cycle of a defined operation. So let's assume the customers in our drive through are ordering peanut butter and banana sandwiches. The cycle time can also be measured in how often I complete a cycle to finish a complete sandwich. If we're measuring the exact same operation, these two times should be identical. Now, when measuring cycle times, I highly recommend you take multiple observations. This is because in any process, there's variation, and this variation causes variation in your cycle times also. Now, if you take multiple observations, over time you're going to start seeing times repeat. Those should be standardized as your cycle time for that particular operation. Now, also keep in mind to make sure you get a full and complete cycle. You often observe operators going to complete an operation, yet you never measure the time of him walking back to the beginning. That's what I mean by taking a full and complete cycle. He makes a start from the beginning all the way to the end, and that walking back time is also part of your cycle time. So now I want to introduce cycle time and lead time. Now, I've often heard these two terms used interchangeably. I'm also surprised to often see these terms improperly defined in industrial engineering textbooks. These are the two most confused terms in manufacturing, so I'm going to clear them up now. Now, lead time is the time that elapses from the moment you order a product to when you receive it. So let's take a moment to relate this back to the paper airplane factory. I'm sitting at the end of the line and I observe a plane being completed every 15 seconds. 
Now, does that mean it took 15 seconds to build a plane from start to finish? No. A measure of the amount of time it takes to build a plane from start to finish is the lead time. I put an X on a plane so I wouldn't lose track of how long this took. In this system, it took about one minute for the plane to make it from start to finish. So I would say the lead time is one minute and the cycle time I observe sitting at the end of the line is 15 seconds. Notice how these are two totally different metrics. Don't confuse the two. So back to our stream example. Let's just say I notice a leaf float by every 30 seconds. Does this mean the leaf floated down the entire river in 30 seconds? Obviously not. It may have taken days for that leaf to finally make it down to where you are standing. The time that elapsed from the moment the leaf touches the water to the moment you observe it is lead time. Now that we've established that cycle time and lead time are different, the next logical question is to ask if there is a relationship between the two. The long answer is yes, it's called Little's Law. This is the top view of the inside of my peanut butter and banana sandwich shop. Let's first make the assumption that people get in line at the same rate at which they leave. In other words, I observe happy customers leaving the line with sandwiches every 30 seconds. Once a person leaves, I notice another one simultaneously gets in line. This is also happening every 30 seconds. Now, I'm going to provide Mr. Little a helping hand by fixing the line in this example at exactly 10 people at any given time. Now, as a side note, Little's Law still works great even if I don't do this because it deals with long-term averages, but I want to show you a quick short-term example. So the math is simple. Again, I see customers leaving every 30 seconds, so this is the cycle time. Now, I'll express this as 0.5 minutes per customer. I now count the number of people in the line, and there are 10 people. So, if I want to know how long I'll wait in line in this steady state system, it's 0.5 minutes per customer times 10 customers in line. Little's Law shows that I can expect to wait 5 minutes if I'm the 10th person in line. This is the relationship between cycle time and lead time. Now, this steady state where customers enter and exit at the same rate is a big assumption. Obviously, this may not hold true. In the case where orders or customers enter faster than they can be processed, the line can grow to infinity. For illustration purposes, we made the assumption that customers flow first in, first out. We all know this isn't always the case either. A supervisor may push an order to the front of the line. A person in line may know the guy making the sandwiches and go to the special express lane. In these cases, you have no idea how long you will wait in line. Amazingly, even under this chaotic state, Little's Law still holds true. Because Little's Law is so robust, a customer can still expect to wait on average five minutes. But obviously, there's far less certainty around the five minutes. Again, it may be one minute, it may be 40 minutes. With no structure, all we can go by is rough averages. This volatile model where you see customers push, claw, or sweet talk their way to the front is what I refer to as dynamic scheduling as opposed to static scheduling presented in the previous more orderly model. So hopefully this sheds some light on the difference between lead time and cycle time and their relationship. I often hear these two terms used interchangeably and it has more than once caused me to have a seizure. It makes me wonder when I see large initiatives for cycle time improvements. Customers really don't care how often parts pop off the end of your production line, but they do care how long they have to wait in line. The reality is, these large initiatives are actually aimed at improving lead time, not cycle time. So back to Little's Law and our question around the relationship between cycle time and lead time. In our example, the best way to decrease lead time is to fix, then reduce the number of people in line. If your line is constantly growing and shrinking, reducing cycle time may not have an impact on lead time. In other words, Kaizen events aimed at reducing lead time by finding ways to process faster may not deliver the desired impact on lead time. Now, let's relate this back to the stream example. Imagine a leaf represents an order from a customer. In this example, a leaf may make it out quickly or it may sit and make many loops in a pool on the side of the stream. The lack of structure in this model makes it pretty unpredictable. Notice in this model you have very little idea as to how long it will take your particular leaf to make it all the way downstream. So here's a more structured model. A narrow tube where orders flow in and out quickly, and more importantly, predictably, is obviously better than the meandering stream you previously saw. In this model, the leaves enter and exit at a much more predictable rate. Also, note that it doesn't matter where along the tube I decide to take my cycle time measurement. This tube represents a balanced line, and at any point along the line will give me the same result for cycle time. 
The same cannot be said about the meandering pond. The first step in creating this more desirable state is to ask your customers to get in line. Stop pushing and shoving and ask your order takers to stop accepting winks and threats from customers so the system can run smoothly and predictably. This is what the meandering pond model looks like on the manufacturing floor. Notice all of the chaos there is. This is the structured tube approach. This model is much less chaotic and planes are being completed predictably at around the same time. Cycle times at each station are roughly balanced so there's not much waiting going on, nor are workers overburdened. Now an operator load chart is a visual representation that shows you your cycle time per station or per worker. And what's great about it is you can take a quick glance and see if your workstations are balanced by cycle time. So let's go back to the drive through example. The original model was a single operator system. Now, fast food chains were starting to get more and more competitive. Demand increased, so they needed to look for ways to service more customers within the 108 seconds. So, they cut their cycle times in half by splitting the total work content of 108 seconds between two stations. Now, they were serving customers every 54 seconds. So I now observe customers leaving every 54 seconds instead of every 108 seconds. They doubled the number of customers they could serve within the same time frame by redistributing their work between two stations. This is an application of division of labor we saw in the history section from Adam Smith. Everything was great for a while, but customer demand for drive through sandwiches increased, so cycle times had to be cut again. This time around, three stations were created. In our model, we divide the total work content of 108 seconds by three. The tasks break up evenly between three stations. The first station is for you to shout out orders. This takes about 36 seconds or so. Then at the next station, there is a worker that takes your money and gives you change. This also takes about 36 seconds. The worker at the last station is responsible for giving you your food. This takes another 36 seconds. So, note that the cycle times are balanced evenly at 36 seconds for each station. In other words, I observe each station completing their work and sending on the customer to the next station every 36 seconds. I also observe a happy customer leaving every 36 seconds. So basically, we can now serve three times the customers it took to serve one when we had a single operator window. This model works great, but over time we notice that demand is too high for our system to handle. Now, this is where things get interesting. We've reached a point where we can't cut cycle time at each station because it doesn't make sense from a task perspective. It wouldn't make sense to have six workstations where the first station takes half your order and the second station takes the other half. It might work for the next two stations, one station taking your money and the other station giving your change, but it wouldn't work well to receive half your order at station number five and the other half at station number six. In order to double our output, we now need two identical lines. This clever design is what takes place at Chick-fil-A's and McDonald's in very high traffic areas. So now when I time how often customers are exiting the system, it's one every 18 seconds. Reaching this point of cycle time division saturation is a beautiful thing if you can't keep up with customer demand. Remember to keep Adam Smith's example in mind and to try to continue to divide work among as many stations as possible before you install a new line for the same task. Remember, shorter tasks divided among many workers can lead to huge productivity gains. Now, there are four different types of cycle times that we'll be reviewing. First is the observed cycle time. Second is the machine cycle time. Third is the manual cycle time. And last is the effective machine cycle time. Let's develop cycle time a little further. What I've been calling cycle time can also be called observed cycle time. This is because it's what I observe on the shop floor. The next cycle time I want to introduce is machine cycle time. When working with a machine, this is how long it takes for the machine to complete a single cycle of an operation. If you recall our toaster, it takes 77 seconds to toast bread. This is the machine cycle time. In general, workers are coupled with machines to perform manual tasks like fitting or loading and unloading parts. This is called manual cycle time. So in our case, it takes 10 seconds to load and unload the toaster. So the manual cycle time is 10 seconds. If you add the two up, this is exactly your observed cycle time. So you should see toast being completed every 87 seconds. So the final type of cycle time we'll go over is effective machine cycle time. 
This is the net cycle time which accounts for manual loading and unloading, machine cycle time, changeover time, and batch size. When you're on the shop floor and you notice a machine spitting out a part one per second, it's very tempting to assume that the one second machine cycle time you're observing tells the whole story. This is a dangerous assumption. With virtually all machinery, there is some sort of change over time and parts also run in a batch. Manual loading and unloading of parts also takes place. All of these are baked into the formula for effective machine cycle time. Effective machine cycle time gives you another and arguably better view of cycle times in your facility rather than simple machine cycle time. So here's an example. Engineers at Simplex Improvement Monitor Factory observe a machine producing one monitor in 60 seconds. This is the machine cycle time. This was observed numerous times before being presented to upper management. Having studied effective machine cycle time, a member of upper management asked the engineers to factor in the manual loading time of 10 seconds and the manual unloading time of 10 seconds. He also asked that the changeover time of 120 seconds be accounted for. The engineers also discovered later that the monitors ran in batches of 20. The effective machine cycle time is the sum of the machine cycle time, load time, unload time, and the time per piece of setup. In this case, the effective machine cycle time is 60 seconds of machine cycle time, 10 seconds of load time, 10 seconds of unload time, and 120 seconds divided by 20, which is a setup time for piece. This equals 86 seconds. In other words, monitors were only being produced once every 86 seconds, not once every 60 seconds as originally observed. So keep this in mind when you're on the shop floor observing cycle times. You're only getting a portion of the picture if you're only capturing the machine cycle time. Effective machine cycle time is an important part of understanding what's really going on on your shop floor. Now, just as a general rule of thumb, your cycle time, or in this case your observed cycle time, will be less than your effective machine cycle time, and this will be less than your lead time. So here's a quick summary of what we learned. We defined what cycle time is, we compared that to lead time, we did a short intro into Little's Law, we looked at operator load charts, and we went into different types of cycle time.